Hey there, BookTube. Noah, everyone who reads and must converse is the channel. Hey, Tom. Hello, everyone. Hey, Noah. Cool. Um, how are you tonight, Tom? Doing very well. Very well. Thank you. Um, awesome. I love your channel, Tom. I tell you, Tom L.A. Books is doing an epic. I mean, it's going to be at some point the most watched uh, hopefully the most watched but definitely the most loved videos on youtube he's doing a series through the divine comedy canto by canto there will be a video exploring every canto at some point and i can't tell you how grateful i am for the project brother um y'all check out tom la books's channel uh if you get a chance it'll be in the description box for sure um but tom and i buddy read the Broom of the System by David Foster Wallace. <laughs> I'm so happy about it too, Tom. <laughs> Very different editions, by the way. They, it is. is I, have the, the, I have the Jane Mansfield edition. <laughs> yeah, so, um, David, uh, Tom loves Infinite Jest and Tom loves David Foster Wallace. As, and I love David Foster Wallace. There's a lot of uh, content on my channel, uh, mainly going through his Oblivion series, but we chose to uh, buddy read David Foster Wallace's first novel. And this was partly a thesis in university. One of two theses that he wrote and he's like mid twenties. It's just so it's ridiculous what this guy was capable of. And um, I guess I'd like to start off just going into it with first impressions, Tom, let's just talk about how we thought about it and things like that. Or anything you want to add before we really like uh, get started with the book itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I simply loved it. It's, uh, it's funny more than anything else that I can, I, I can think of. And uh, um, I read uh, in terms of its fiction, I only read infinite jest before reading this one. Cool. And David Foster Wallace, I heard him, in an interview say that I mean he was very self-critical but about this book he said himself uh, um, that he wasn't too happy because it sounded like it, it was written by a, a very smart 14 year old That's what <laughs> and uh, I mean I can say I can I can see why he said that because it's uh, it's a bit of a rough rough gem you know there there is right. the he was 24 after all. I mean, 24 is 24. What kind of experience do you have right. to really write a, a, a powerful novel, right? Right. We'll get into that a little bit more for sure, because that was one of the things that kind of came out, especially these things that, you know, he was very aware of his own limitations, even er, even in writing this thing. And then later in life became even more critical of it as his uh mastery of writing expanded you know what i mean that kind of thing um i had the kind of same uh initial impressions in a way and these are impressions that are unanimous and i mean unanimous even if you watch videos of people who you know are really critical of david foster wallace and being like oh you know dude bro you know don't read him who gives a crap about this guy they still say that he is hilarious and he is clever. Um, and all the uh, synonyms that go along with both of those two terms, he's intelligent. He's uh, very, he's uh, very funny and all that. And, and this book being his first one, I think was the funniest thing that I've ever read by David Foster Wallace. And the main things that I've read are, are essays for sure. And they have this kind of tongue in cheek style or the way that they might approach a, a topic like consider the lobster things like that came to mind like it's funny but this being uh, my first you know fiction that's a longer form i've never read infinite jest or any other novels by david foster walsh just short stories this was by far the funniest thing that i've ever read by him yeah. i was laughing so much yeah and um Another first impression is this kind of idea that I that this is a quintessential kind of postmodern work. What he's going for is like the idea of postmodernism, where we're at in literature at the time when he was writing this. What was it? Late 80s, 87. Is that right? 
Yeah, exactly. The, right. uh, he wrote it in the, in the late 80s. It's based in 1990, I believe. Right. So at that point, you know, he was and it's 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 obvious that with the structure of this thing that he was throwing out the tricks that he had come in contact with and showing how he could do it. And he is trying to flex it, I think. I think he, he's doing that a very good job. Just so anybody knows, uh, there's chapters in here that, you know, are third person omniscient narrator, just like any other story that you might tell. Maybe it's first person omniscient. Maybe it's a nested narrative where somebody in the book is telling you a story. And then there's transcripts. And then there is short chapters that are just conversations. They're all dialogue. And you might just get one dialogue piece from people. And then there are chapters all throughout it that are just broken up, kind of sliced. Yeah. And they show and they show like portraits, I think, of all the different characters and different people that are involved in the narrative as a whole at, at where they're at. Yeah. And so there's this chapter 11, for example, part A, part B, part B, C, D, E, F, G. And so but that is not with regularity. I mean, it happens throughout the whole book, but it's not like every third chapter or every fourth chapter. It's yeah, he's just playing with structure. In terms of uh, first impressions, um, I've also, uh, having read Infinite Jest uh, last year, I was also surprised and maybe even shocked by how much this reads like a, like a mini Infinite Jest in preparation for the big, no, the big, you know, Infinite Jest novel. Uh, Infinite Jest has uh, a lot of funny moments, but like you say, never as powerfully, intoxicatingly funny as this book, because, you know, there's nobody who feels like laughing in the face of life as a 20 year old. <laughs> right. Especially somebody who is in university, uh, you know, lots of uh, alcohol and drugs going around. That's the environment where this book was conceived, and you can feel it. You can feel yeah. it. You you can, and that that hits the nail on the head. How intense is the is the 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 story of this? It just keeps driving along, and it seems like it keeps raising the bar uh, with how far it can go as far as absurdity and hilarity and this kind of laughing in the face of life, like you're saying. That's exactly right. What he's doing here. Um, it's wild. I mean, just so fun. The characters that he's come up with uh, for us are fun. And um, I think that he used a lot of these kind of things. You know, he was very aware that the author's voice is going to come through no matter what. And so you 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 sense a lot of David Foster Wallace in this just as much as um, in any other novel, but maybe more refined in other novels. So... I can't wait to read Infinite Jest. It's right in front of me on my TBR. I'm about to jump into it, and you're along for the read along. Is that right? Absolutely. I'm. I'm uh, very much enjoying it already. You could say that uh, um, you, the profundity that is lacking in the broom of the system finally kind of peeps out in uh, Infinite Jest because you can see that life happened in between the moment when you yeah. wrote one and the other. And especially in his case, he got some serious troubles, um, you know, intoxication. He was an addict and, and all that. But when he was 24, you know, col his college name is Amherst, which by pure coincidence is exactly the college where every single character in the room of the system went to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't wait. This, you know, we can't we can't really talk about it without getting in deeper. So um, I want to just kind of, is there, is there anything else we want to say about the beginning of this? I mean, that it's very funny. The characters are so memorable. Some of them are caricatures. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are characters and it builds a very, um, there is a mystery in this, you know, where the, the old ladies and, and men from the old folks home have disappeared to. And so there's a mystery kind of thing vein running through this it's very intriguing you do want to keep reading for the plot as a well as for these kind of absurdist funny things and the characters as well you know lenore and um her boyfriend there you you really 
can't wait to see what happens with them and their pet bird. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, yeah. but is there anything else you want to say first off before we just get into it? Because I'm ready to just talk about. No, we can we can get started. Maybe I would ask you, what do you think about the the type of humor, the, the, the type of sense of humor that he's using? You know, if you compare it to different type of comedy or, sure. or com writing that, that you can think of. Sure. Um, I mean, I love I love all humor in writing. If it makes me laugh, if it really is humorous and, and works. And, you know, I mean, as far as hilarious stuff, some stuff that I've really laughed out loud with over the last year or more. Um, there's <laughs> David Foster or there's uh, William Gaddis, right, who oh. is completely hilarious and but he's kind of it's so such biting satire and he was such a master at that working at the Harvard Lampoon before for the Harvard yeah. Lampoon before he started his writing career that it's it's like cry laughing <laughs> at the world <laughs> you know okay. yeah and then so David Foster Wallace is more that's just in the vein of absurdist exactly and and you're and just trying to push it as far as possible that um as far as the enjoyment of reading itself um i enjoyed it the most probably the most as far as uh the way comedy is worked out through things that i've read in in a long time because um if you if you're if you're good at that kind of thing if it's done well then that kind of thing, you, you know, you're just waiting for the next step. And by the end of this book, you know, the last third of it, I was just waiting like, OK, where is he taking it next? OK, he's yeah. not going to stop. I know he's not going to stop. What where where are we going with this? You know, and I knew it was going to be nuts. Like if if where we're at is not nuts enough yet, that's what it <laughs> felt like, you know. Yeah, yeah, that you said it very well. That's uh, that's the same feelings I've got about this sense of humor, which in towards the end, especially the third part, let's say, really gets into surrealism. And uh, I remember we were chatting while we were buddy reading this, and you, I think, you, you wrote to me and said, oh, this is becoming, becoming completely surreal at this point, yeah. which yeah. you don't expect. And it's not too surreal, but there's a level of surrealism, right? Right. It, it definitely is. And that's where, you know, I, I had hit and I'm thinking, oh, uh, you know, when they started calling, they just so anybody uh, is up to speed. I'm talking about the desert that they, you know, artificially make in Ohio to invoke uh, <laughs> the the populace to be happy for what they have. Yeah, they're going to put a desert by them and be like, hey, go check out this desolation. You know, and 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 they start calling it the Great Ohio Desert, and then they and they start calling it God, <laughs> and it's just oh, and it's just like, yes, I don't know what he's doing with this, and it turns out that he's not really, you know, he's not fulfilling something uh, of this of of the of the level that he's taking it. Um, he's good at taking it. He probably is this kind of person that you could see him sitting around with his buddies drinking and them just telling stories and telling and, and taking it them as far as they can think of to take them but and behind that having a philosophical bent to his nature and and what he's learned but he's not trying to you know encapsulate it all at the end like button it up or anything like that it's just the explorations take over the yes. explorations themselves like a, 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 a tsunami of ideas the, the the number the sheer number of ideas in the book are made and it, you know it's not necessarily a positive comment because you might say that there are far too many ideas and he doesn't button them up like you say that he doesn't uh, uh, gel them all together in the novel and that's part of somebody as a non completely mature novelist um but it just keeps shooting he's, he's got this hyperactive imagination and intelligence that stimulates you constantly right yeah 
Definitely. Um, it, it's so intellectually stimulating. I can't even, you know what I mean? You're just, you're constantly like, yeah, okay, let's go. And, and it, and it is, you know, you have to get into this person's mind. Um, in this way, I want to I want to bring up because we did talk about limitations and things that that this book might have. And and um, I think it's valid to put them out on the table because you're hearing a story that is, you know, from the personal mind and, and knowingly so of a 25 year old male, you know, prep school <laughs> uh, uni uh, kid that kind sees of- his own limitations. Go yeah. ahead. Uh, wonder kid I, i'm not sure how much is seeing his own limitation was a, actual you know humility or just in cleverness of understanding right. how, well he does uh, i think you're right i think you're right it, it's not that it, it he's being humble in looking at it maybe there is some humility in that or maybe that come through some in later things that he said about it but i think how he approached the work uh, the broom of the system with his own limitations is to use them as plot right. device, use them in the text. So he had things like uh, in the first chapter, of course, you called out male gaze and that first chapter ends up what, what I, what I really think that we have going on here is a, a kind of love and, and, and a kind of um, exploration of storytelling itself. Absolutely. Like you said, with, um, with there being so many stories and, and, it, and it, it, he is a storyteller and he sees himself as such, but he knows that. And these stories might not have great, you know, be, be um, a, a, a complete unit in of themselves. They're just, they're just stories or starts of stories. So he works this kind of thing into there. Um, but when he's doing this kind of thing and these, these limitations, the language that he uses, Uh, We called out that he is from Amherst, uh, the college that this book is everybody's from Amherst. So he can feel free to speak and to write the way that he does. And it works for the story rather than it being a limitation. But it definitely is a limitation because ask him at that age, at that time to write something from, you know, uh, a a Southern Gothic style, you know, some William Faulkner or something like this, he would not, he would never do it uh, as successful as he does this. So he used these kind of things, Um, his male gaze, his uh, jargon, you know, Amherst university jargon (laughs) and things like that for the, for the uh, story. What do you think? Yes. So the, aside from comedy, uh, it really sounds like his main two interests from the book are language and and story in general as storytelling so language and storytelling and uh, uh, as i was sharing with you i maybe heard in an interview or read somewhere that his parents were or still are if they're alive uh, teachers and professors and he grew up in an environment in his home where everyone was really especially his mother i believe was really attentive to the use of language terminology precision maybe not in a in a strict uh, unpleasant kind of way it was something that he absorbed you know he or even uh, probably i mean the way that he is with it is in an explorative and fun kind of way and i heard that david foster wallace is the kind of guy that read the dictionary yeah yeah you know and but he did it for fun i mean it's just a love of words and language Yes, like a like a scientist who loves his own his own su- subject, David Foster Lo- Wallace loves language. And uh, once again, this maybe um, sounds uh, completely positive, but maybe it's not because uh, one thing is to love language and to be a genius scientist of language, and another thing is to write a great work of fiction. There are two different things. Um, so while I loved it. There was so much um, beauty in this. It's more, I feel like it's more um, of a document that attests to this love of language rather than a perfect novel, in, in my opinion. Sure. sure. Still, it's still a great book, but I hope this is, uh, I'm being clear, clear, clear enough. I think so. 
and I mean, I would, I would, I would agree that you know, no part of me thinks that this book is like a perfect book or something like this, or, mm-hmm. or even it, it is amazing uh, for a first novel, for sure. Um, but you know, since I brought up Gaddis earlier, I might as well stick with it. The recognitions Gaddis's first novel, you know, is four times the book. That right. is, it's amazing. I mean, it's unbelievable. So as ambitious that this book might seem, it actually is right in the vein for what literature was doing at the time it was written and all this kind of thing. And it is somebody who, you know, David Foster Wallace thought he was and probably knew that most of the time he might be the smartest person in the room. Right. You know, and, and his arrogance and, and this kind of thing might is is not on uh not based on no foundation, you know. I mean there's 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 reason for this all this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, uh, but it, 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 sometimes you can hear from the choice of words and the uh, uh, sentencing that he is writing also to impress. This is probably true. Um, but still, you know, um, let's remember what the book is. It's something that's been written by this 24-year-old. I right. remember uh, reading some reviews from the 80s when the book came out. And in these reviews, they were saying, well, I mean, there is some spark of genius here and there. But uh, um, it really sounds like, you know, uh, Pynchon. It really sounds like uh, Gaddis in some in some parts. Yes. Only... Uh, only smaller because i mean he's a he's a kid he's a kid right 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 (laughs) that's great okay so i mean and i I think we've done enough you know kind of to to back us up but okay so what is he exploring here you know in this uh book there's so much he explores selfhood is a big theme of like the self as opposed to the other and this inner outer dichotomy is is explored all over the place but in ridiculous absurdist ways um bombardini who is um this <laughs> jabba the hut figure <laughs> he Doma. believes he's the he's a megalomaniac kind of landlord and he's going through a divorce and because he's going through a divorce he's going to eat his emotions right i mean he's just but he's developed this philosophy where if he gets bigger then everything else gets smaller and it's more him and less, you know, the universe. And he's going to take over the universe with exactly. his gluttony. <laughs> yeah. So this is a perfect example of how you can start from, uh, uh, when you're talking to a kid, a smart kid, you can start from a semi-serious argument, but then the kid will take it to absurd extremes and, and make, and, and, and find a way to laugh about it. And this is exactly what, what he's doing. Um, okay. it, there is a, the philosophical angle, and then he say, okay, for these reasons, then the character is, it decides to eat the entire universe, which is completely surreal and, and funny. Yeah. Uh, uh, there, there was a lot, of, um, a lot of theory of language in, uh, in, in the book, uh, especially the the games that you can play with language that um, echo some of what uh, Wittgenstein had written. I'm uh, not somebody who knows uh, Wittgenstein uh, inside and out, but uh, uh, he does refer to specifics about Wittgenstein's work in the book, especially when he brings up some of the language game examples. Like, for example, you remember the barber who cannot shave himself? Right. Or, um, this other example, which is a, a philosophy of language, a typical game, when you ask, uh, uh, okay, the barber is somebody who only shaves the people who don't shave themselves. Now, based on this, can the barber shave himself? And and, and you, you your head explodes because... In the end, you realize that if the barber does shave himself, then the definition of somebody who doesn't shave himself doesn't apply to him anymore. Right. Uh, it, it, there's no real profundity around it, but it's it's fun. It's a fun mind game, and, and he right. loves this type and, of stuff. And in in words and in 
a little bit of logic even it it uh can drive you crazy it, like it makes you it's yeah. absurd it goes to that level and and a one one other that i thought of there was uh it's just one phrase i love it because it's so succinct i might not get it just right though but is the statement that i'm saying is a lie <laughs> and it's just like this kind of thing where it's like wait wait what uh, why why is it <laughs> you know and these kind of scenes um it's wonderful how he takes it, not just in the stories that are in the book, because we go through a lot of stories. Yes. Um, Lenore, the main, our main character is a boy as the girlfriend to the owner of her company that she works for frequent and vigorous. And uh, he's um, a, like an editor. Right. He's an editor for a magazine. They put out a publication, literary magazine, um, and they're constantly telling stories to each other and all this kind of thing. And Lenore had this has this kind of thing with her grandmother, who we never meet. She's the one, you know, her and her posse uh, escape from the uh, the old folks home. <laughs> Yeah. And that's the mystery that you're kind of following through this book. And it's totally funny and weird and absurd. But she has been, you know, she's the closest to this grandmother. She'd gone by and talked to her all the time. And the grandmother has this thing where she taught. That's where the things of Wittgenstein come out. Because she taught Lenore to look at herself in this way of, words and usefulness utility being the only thing that defines you yeah. and she's having a problem finding her selfhood in uh in the midst of all these different people's stories about her yeah and or you, even her own story about herself yeah you this is probably what you just touched on is probably the central core of the entire novel right and you ask me what do you think the novel is about it's this uh, yeah from a plot point of view like you say there is this uh, kind of love relationship between uh, a, a girl and a, and a boy or a man and a woman but really it's more about her this character of Lenore and how she relates to herself how she understands herself uh, through experience and growing but weirdly through language itself, because at a certain point uh, you pointed out during our body read that uh, she almost sounds like she realizes that she's a character in, in, a, in a book. Isn't that right. she? Yeah, she does. And when she's talking to the psychologist, <laughs> <laughs> we'll get, we'll get to him. I don't want to jump into the psychologist just yet. I do yeah. want to say <laughs> that, that, that is, that is a major theme and you can know, I'm not, I mean, we're already to like kind of spoiler territory. Okay. So for real. Um, so you can tell by the, where Lenore ends up or gets to in this, that she's just, you know, staring at the sky, like begging for <laughs> release <laughs> from this craziness, just complete, you know, um, complete loss. I mean, she's, she is perdition. She has no, no, no bearings anymore because everything um, is kind of just going. Yeah, the, um, exactly. I, I, I don't even know if we could say the broom of the system, you know, has a, a, a really well defined plot. I mean, yes, right. it does because there are some events that happen, but uh, it doesn't sound like the author cared about plot. No. No, it's, to... it's 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 about it's a love of storytelling. I think I think yeah. that the best way to look at this book is just like a love of stories and seeing himself as a storyteller and then telling a great story. And just so anybody knows what we keep referring to with this, because we hadn't said it explicitly. Rick Vigorous, who is Lenore's boyfriend, um, is constantly telling stories to Lenore throughout this thing. And then at the by the end of it, Lenore is like. <laughs> It's her job now to read <laughs> stories. And she's just like, oh, God, I'm over here reading all these stories. You know, something that she loved before is now made into this <laughs> job. <Yes. laughs> oh, it's so ridiculous. And let me let me just say, before we get to uh, anything else, 
when it became Lenore's job to read stories and Rick gave her this kind of thing. And then there was that one story that they kind of focused on after that. Did Rick Vigorous write that story? Oh, uh, do you think, what do you think? It's a great question. This is something that, um, it's never confirmed. It's not divulged. Yeah, but it's possible, right? It, it, it's yeah. a, it's another clever way to leave things a little bit in an ambiguous way so that you you decide yourself. I uh, thought I thought that maybe David Foster Wallace really did. And, and I mean, this would be great. Uh, put that in there that that's why Rick has this kind of it seems like a personal uh, he it seems like he does have something personal writing on whether or not Lenore likes this one story or not. And it it plays out in this real weird, you know, inadequacy and whatever. The whole dichotomy that Rick has going on between obsession and inadequacy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. I, I thought I, I thought maybe maybe Rick inserted his own story in there as a way because he is over intellectual as a way to see if Lenore would give it a check and say, this is good stuff without him saying that it's him or that it's his writing to see if Lenore really likes him or not. <laughs> that That's a good read. Um, I'm, uh, I would agree with that. You know, <clears throat> it, it basically here, here we have a character who is not very difficult to imagine as David Foster Wallace as a 24 year old spending right. time with her girlfriend. And... Are you saying are you saying DFW had a small penis? No. <laughs> <laughs> Hot take. Hot <laughs> take, y'all. <laughs> the, the character does. I don't think he would have written that if, if he did. But uh, in in terms of the relationship, it's funny some sometimes how you read uh, a long paragraph of what the boyfriend is talking about his own stories. And uh, the girlfriend only re only answers with uh, uh, four or three words uh, sentence, mm -hmm. which sometimes is not even related to what he is saying. It's something like, uh, oh, remember to you know, just uh, open the door for me or pick up this and that. So it really sounds like something that he was experiencing as a relationship, it being somebody who most likely had this verbal diarrhea you know he kept you know thinking and speaking right. said, and uh, you know to in order to be able to bear with somebody like that to stand him the the girl or whoever is listening to him needs to be a little patient as well and being a good listener no for sure for sure and lenore definitely was i mean her kind of thing is to say story please you know yeah and yeah. and and no doubt um I would think I would say first off, no doubt David Foster Wallace knew a guy, or he was that guy. Exactly for <laughs> up, to, uh, up to what point you know of uh, representation and uh, uh, because there are so many jokes you you get you get lost. My uh, my surprise is at seeing how you know. I think when you're writing a, a full novel, well, this is 500 pages, almost 500 pages. Yeah, 467 and, in mine. Right. And uh, you throw such a typhoon of ideas into them because it's so many flipping ideas. Um, what's difficult is to make them all go together in a way right. that they are, they, they have something to do with each other. Otherwise, it's just right. ideas thrown around. And uh, uh, he, he, I think he achieves this up to a certain point. Um, some of these ideas just kind of are left there and don't. Right. There. But I think many, so too. Yeah, but many of them, like you were saying before, you read a story, for example, by the boyfriend, and you realize that it's not simply a story, but it has to do with uh, the broader sense of the novel. Right. Well, and there is merit to illuminating different aspects of a problem just that so the problem of identity 
Yes. You know, as a, as, a, as just a, one thing, a problem of identity and identifying yourself. So there is a psychologist that makes, uh, <laughs> you know, appearance in here. And this is, this is the kind of thing. And we have a psychologist. I, I couldn't help, but think of good old neon and how David Foster Wallace is showing his understanding and depth, depth of him of self understanding that it's hard for a psychologist to get deep because unless you are really ready to be vulnerable and open up and really just do it, then, you know, it just is never going to happen with somebody who um, has a depth of understanding of self and is smart the way that David Foster Wallace is. But in this, it is, um, it, it is completely hilarious yeah. And um, shows that even at an early age, you know, David Foster Wallace was taking philosophy, very hardcore and psychology uh, a lot. I'm sure he was very interested in the way that the mind works. So yeah. um, he had a lot of knowledge with this. But the, the psychologist himself, this is an aspect, I think, of illustrating what you're saying before with he can show a lot and he can explore a lot, but actually he doesn't know really where to take it. There's not, you know, in this novel, you see there's not an end point. He doesn't know where to land. Right. right, right, exactly. And, you know, it would be surprising if somebody at 24 was able to do that. I mean, that's right. more than genius. But uh, so, yeah, he creates this uh, character of the psychologist and uh, those uh, scenes where he writes the dialogue back and forth between the psychologist and the main female character and the and, and the main male character are some of the funniest scenes in the entire book <coughs> they are <coughs> this is uh, david foster wallace uh, mocking mercilessly uh, almost the, the entire profession of psychology because the way the psychology comes across is very incompetent, very um, delusional. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, an actual psychologist talked to Dave Foster Wallace and made the mistake of telling him something like, I smell a little bit of breakthrough right now <laughs> because that sentence has been taken by, the, by, by Wallace and made into an entire running joke in uh, in these scenes where the smell of breakthrough. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Okay, so he starts setting up the psychologist first with the chairs that move themselves and nobody's allowed to walk in his <laughs> whole office. Like they get in the waiting room and they sit in a chair and this chair is motorized and he moves it to his <laughs> office and out. And, and so they're talking with him and they have to go, uh, start the chair, please. I'm yeah. done here. <laughs> so they start with this kind of absurdity. And then he's like, in the middle of it, I have an injection button, an eject button. Yes. You need to stop. I'll eject you. You'll go right into that lake over there. I'll eject you. It's ridiculous. But then yeah. he starts talking about the breakthrough. I, I have this overwhelming scent of breakthrough in the air. You know? <laughs> The, break, the breakthrough is stifling in here, is it not? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yes, um, you. It, it's it's really great comedy. It reminds me of, a little bit of uh, the really old uh, Woody Allen. You know, when he was young right. and writing powerful comedy stuff. Um, that's how that's how funny and surreal it is. And like you were saying, it gets more and more surreal to this type of apotheosis, uh, maybe the final thing with the psychologist. I don't know if we want to spoil that or not. We can just... We're, uh, we're already past that point, brother. Let's go. Um, where, uh, where this uh, running joke of the stench of breakthrough <laughs> is uh, taken to the utmost level and uh, the psychologist is uh, pulling out of uh, under his desk an actual gas mask protect himself <laughs> from the stench of breakthrough that he's spending here. Not, not a Kim Basinger just over the mouth mask either. You get the sense that it's like a full head gas oh, yeah. mask. <laughs> and, he's, and he's saying, 
if I, what did he say? If I were to take off my mask right now, the stench of breakthrough might knock me unconscious. Would kill me. <laughs> Would kill me. <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's really hilarious. Um, we, when, uh, in fact, you can clearly understand from the dialogue that there is no breakthrough at all. The, the dialogue is not going in a good way at all. So it's uh, it's really. Really it's so funny. So I will say just to just to since we're talking about how he wraps it up and all this kind of thing, I think that I can see how he tried to do it and like what it is, because everyone, uh, you know, kind of finds their place. Do they not? Rick Vigorous ends up with his even younger <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sweetheart who, you know, barely, you know you get this sense that this this female doesn't care about you man or or your small penis okay <laughs> they they just care that you're a millionaire you know business owner here you're you're good okay uh but vlad the impaler we didn't even talk about vlad the impaler too much but yeah. how these kind of things button up lenore where the grandmother is um the absurdity wraps up absurdly. The characters that you feel for kind of find their place in a way. I think that, um, you know, everybody knew each other. Everybody, you know, kind of there was the, there was this kind of by the end of it, there was this kind of maybe it wasn't full, but it was kind of an interlocking of of all the desperate narratives of the storytelling found their place. And it just felt like the story buttoning up and he was, and he was doing that on purpose. I mean, you know, yeah, this from, young writer doing what, what he knew had to be done to finish the story. Right, right, right. So exactly from a structural point of view, yes, he's, uh, he knew what had to be done. And uh, by the end of the book, he tries to converge to make all these crazy lines converge into uh, almost theatrical grand finale and um, which is uh, you know which works and is funny etc uh, it, it felt to me like it was maybe a little bit uh, non spontaneous because you really you really see some all the characters kind of getting into the stage where it doesn't make too much sense uh, from, yeah it's crazy <laughs> Dude, Judith Priest over there is like saying hey to people with her cat. With her cat. <laughs> hey, <laughs> Mr. Vigorous. Like, yeah. randomly, like in the last chapters. <laughs> like, what are you doing? What is happening here? Bombardini's smashing himself up against the back of the building. <laughs> His... <laughs> unbelievable girth I, you know what i really wish that david foster wallace gave us another scene where bombardini was in it yeah he was a little underutilized as a character yeah. I, I, I wish he you know he's always in the background are they they hear him coming like the footsteps of the t-rex in jurassic park <laughs> yes. you know they hear him coming but they but you don't ever see him uh later in the book i wish we saw him to kind yeah. of really put so that David Foster Wallace could explore that because you really do get caught up in how far he can push it, how far the absurdity or is, is going to take it. So, um, yeah, there's a, uh, there's something to be said also about, uh, you know, the fact that this is like you mentioned postmodern. So he kind of gets into that, um, I know. Even if uh, then later on, uh, Wallace was talking about something like being trying to be post postmodern, and I have no idea what, exactly what he meant, but uh, that's what he tried to do with uh, Infinite Jest. In in reality, with Broom of the System, he is uh, uh, trying to imitate and improve on the postmodernists, uh, like right. mentioned, and also like uh, the Lillo. You know, the Lillo is another example of somebody who is postmodern and uh, at the same in the same way in a similar way you enjoy the paragraph or the sentence or, or the page right. even more than the chapter or the entire book no right. 
Right. I think you're I think you're exactly right with that. Delillo is really, really good with that. Um, just having these beautiful phrasings or sentences, just it especially when you're reading these big books, these postmodern or or you know, just big works that have these sometimes overblown sentences, long that's what they're doing. They're flexing the sentence. When you find this writer, like I did with Don DeLillo reading Underworld this year, it was like all these short, beautiful sentences. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me that. You know, give me give me more. Um, and David Foster Wallace is definitely you can see that he is as concerned with the minutia. Yes, as he is the work as a whole. And it must be crazy. And and. Anytime you read anything of David Foster Wallace's, I think you think this, it must be crazy to be in that person's head. Yeah. Um, it, it <clears throat> hypercritical. Hypercritical, maybe with uh, more um, success with the minutia rather than the entire work. Once again, a novel is a novel. It's, uh, uh, it's like building a cathedral. And uh, it's so difficult in itself that, you can see the imperfection in how it's uh, it's built, but uh, um, you know I I even if you take a little scene, a couple of pages, and you read it in a, an anthology or a maybe short story collection, you will still enjoy it very much because right. that's the level of attention to the detail and the and the intensity. No? Yeah, and and you're exactly right there. Um, if anything. You can describe this book with one word, and it's intense. It's intense. <laughs> it's great. It's a great read. It's a fun read. It's a stimulating read intellectually and um, just in the love of language. There's so much to be said about it. Um, but I think that I've said almost as much as I'm going to say. What do you think, Tom? Do you want to go to into any other avenue? Is there something, anything um, that you... No, I think we, we fleshed it out. Uh, I wanted to ask you maybe a final question. What sure. do you think about the very last sentence, which is so enigmatic? The very final sentence of the book, which is basically uh, a sentence that doesn't end, doesn't even yeah. have uh, the punctuation. It goes, uh, it goes, you can trust me, RV says, watching her hand. I'm a man of my... Right. <laughs> it's a... that's, and that's the end of the novel. Right. Uh, it's a it's his ultimate joke because yeah. you your mind fills up the sentence with the with the word word no? right <laughs> yeah. yeah and um you know what is what is the last word 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 word, word. <laughs> <You know? laughs> right. and yeah and david foster wallace's last kind of trick on me like made you say it <laughs> You know, he knows, you know, at least in our minds, he, he just made us say it. And with that, um, there hinges a lot of what exactly the work is, you know, kind of resting on as well. It's it's wild that David Foster Wallace, Wallace didn't go into uh, linguistics more. But, yeah. you know, I wouldn't doubt if in his schooling there was a focus in linguistics as well as uh, philosophy right. and literature yeah. and whatever because he loved words uh as much as you know more than most people and as much as anybody on booktube <laughs> <laughs> and and i love him for it i mean it's really it's really fun i think that it's a way that again with the joking um kind of attitude he still tried to point you to the major theme of the book yeah. which is lenore's um, finding of herself within this chaos of her family and her friends and her boyfriend and her bird and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, he still he still manages to do that, which is, um, I mean, um, a great artist. You can feel that there was a great artist already in the making in in this book, for sure. For sure. For sure. Awesome. Mm. All right. Well, I can't wait to jump into Infinite Jest with you, Tom. Um, that is our next read. I'm taking till the end of the year to read it. We're not going to be pushing it hard. So if you want to get in on a read along of Infinite Jest, 
uh, hit me up. My Voxer. The more, the more be, yeah. And and we'll uh, we'll do it. We got till the end of the year. I'm not going to go past it, so I'm going to finish it before it. I can't wait to read it. Uh, this was really, really fun, Tom. I'll catch you next time, right? My pleasure. Thank you so much. Later, buddy. Later.